Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar, Dollars and Cents, Public Funding to Sustain, to sustain School-Based Mental Health Services. My name is Lisa Eisenberg. I'm the Policy Director here at the California School-Based Health Alliance, and I'm um, so excited to, that you're joining us for our webinar all about funding and um, school-based mental health. So before I get started, um, a couple housekeeping, a cu couple quick housekeeping notes. Um, we are recording the webinar, um, and we'll be sharing a recording of the webinar and um, a copy of the PowerPoint slides will be shared um, about a week after the webinar. So you are welcome um, to share that that recording and those slides with your colleagues, or keep a copy of the slides for your um, records. Um, if you're having trouble hearing the audio, so hopefully if you can't hear me, you can see the directions on the slide. Um, sometimes it is helpful to call in using your telephone as opposed to using your computer audio settings. Um, everyone is, everybody is currently on mute, but if you have questions or comments throughout the webinar, please feel free to use the question and answer function um, in the panel to in, on my computer, it's to the right of the webinar slides. Um, I will try to pause throughout the presentation to answer slides, but I will do my best to get to slides at the end of the webinar. All right, let's get started. So the objectives for the webinar, um, one, I hope you leave this webinar being able to identify federal, state, and local funding streams that can support the full continuum of mental health services in schools. The second objective is that you understand major funding sources such as Medi-Cal and Mental Health Services Act, MHSA. We'll be spending um, a significant chunk of the presentation on specific funding streams and sort of doing um, a, a brief touch on a lot of different funding streams that, fund, that can be used to fund school-based mental health. And then I hope at the end you'll be able to identify strategies for utilizing available funding streams and um, taking next steps to create new partnerships in your schools and in your communities. So I find it helpful to know who is here um, in the metaphorical room <laughs> on the webinar. So um, this is based on the registration that I was able to pull this morning. So we've got a couple more registrations. And again, this is registrations. This is not ne technically those of you who have jumped onto the webinar. But based on re uh, registrations, we have a chunk of folks are from LEAs, um, local education agencies. Um, those are school districts, county offices of education. Um, another Porsche, big portion of those who registered are from local organizations and or local providers of health and mental health services. We have a couple folks from state organizations, both advocacy organizations and um, legislative le uh, organizations and agencies at the, in the state administration and legislature. Um, a couple of folks from foundations and then um, a bucket of folks that I put in the other category, such as um, consultants or some national organization representatives. And then we asked this question when you registered for this webinar. It helps me better gear the content I'm providing in the webinar um, to really meet the needs of those of you that are um, on this webinar. So we asked what funding sources you were familiar with, and we defined that as you know the name, you know how to access funding, um, you know who controls that funding. Um, and you know, we did this, I actually did this webinar um, at the end of the school year last year in June 2018. And we had much more, it was a, a much more education heavy um, audience. And so um, it was interesting to me to see that actually the knowledge is fairly um, spread out across the funding sources um, with you know, a majority of folks on this call really familiar with the local control funding formula. So um, I will do my best to um, 
touch upon all six of these funding sources. We only have an hour. Um, I have many more resources that I can point you to if you leave this webinar with more questions about these funding sources. So before I jump into getting into the nitty gritty details about these funding sources, I want to be really upfront about the principles that I bring to this conversation. Um, funding is very complicated. Um, there, are very, there are many different perspectives on how you can and should use funding. And um, I'm going to be presenting sort of my, my opinion on the strategic use of these funding streams. And so because it's sort of my our opinion based on um, practice, good practices that we've heard from the field, I want to be really clear what I'm bringing to, to these recommendations. So um, the first one is, first principle is that we don't believe schools should be creating mental health services on their own. So I'm going to be talking a lot about community and county fund, county held fund, funding streams because I, I and the California School-Based Health Alliance really believe that there are um, resources for the mental health needs of young people and students is that the county and the community are responsible for. And so we really encourage schools when we work with schools to reach out to these partners um, to build out the mental health services that they are that are available on um, the school campus. The second um, principle is that school mental health services should meet the e meet the educational and health care needs of students. So this, for some of you, this might not be um, that transformative of a principle, but because from the California School-Based Health Alliance, we sit here sort of at the nexus between health and education communities. You on this webinar, you might be from a school district, so you, your perspective is, is much more rooted in the education sector, or you might be from um, a county or healthcare provider, so you might be approaching this from the healthcare needs. And we see school mental health services as addressing both the educational needs of students, you keep students in classrooms, keeps them engaged, reduces barriers to, to coming prepared to learn, and the healthcare needs of students um, to, you know, address the healthcare needs of a young person by offer, offering those services in a school setting, you are reducing some of those access barriers to healthcare. So um, that, that's our perspective is that school mental health really bridge these two um, different fields and meet, meet both of these needs. Our third principle um, is that a student should not have to be in special education to re receive mental health services in a school setting. Um, so we hear a lot about, um, a, lot of, a lot of folks when they hear school mental health, they automatically think of educationally related mental health services. If you don't know that term, we'll be talking about it a little bit later. Um, they, so they are automatically thinking about the mental health needs that are, are in a student's special education plan. And, and while that is certainly a way that a lot of students are getting their mental health needs met, we, we really think that there's, there is a continuum of mental health services that you can be providing to a student before they meet some of the requirements for special education. The fourth principle, um, is I'm going to be talking a lot about a lot of different funding streams, and a lot of these funding can be used for various school-based health services. I am going to be presenting some of these funding streams in a way that I think is the most strategic ways to use funding to support a comprehensive system, to meet mental health needs across a tiered intervention model. So, um, you know, I want to I want to be really clear that there's a distinction. You can you can use mental, you can use very flexible funding to meet the most significant mental health needs of your students. From our perspective, there are more strategic ways to use flexible funding, such as um, local control funding formula, um, is a, is a good example. And then, as I mentioned in the previous principle, our last principle is the goal is to sustain services on, in all three tiers of a comp and create a comprehensive school-based mental health model. So you are meeting um, un universal um, school-wide mental health needs through school climate interventions, teacher trainings, all the way up to more significant ongoing clinical model of mental health care. So that's those are our five principles. Um, I always like to start this presentation so um, it helps 
set the stage um, when I start talking about particular funding sources. Which segues nicely into um, our deep dive into some of these funding sources. So um, this is, if you're not familiar with school-based mental health programs, this is a, a pretty universally accepted model for school-based mental health. It's a, it's a public health model. Um, so it's a three-tiered intervention. And so at the bottom, you have school-wide mental health services, as I mentioned, such as school climate. These are mental health services, mental health mental health information that serves the entire school community. And it funnels up and you serve less and less students as you go up this triangle. So the goal is to sustain services at all three tiers. So we are going to start today's presentation talking about the county mental health funding streams um, on the right side of the diagram. So what I'm proposing is that we overlay some of the funding streams that are available and really utilize those funding streams to fund, pay for, sustain services in that tier of the school-based mental health model. So we're going to start on these three, with these three funding streams that the county mental health system controls. And then on the other side, you have four funding streams that schools are really responsible for. Um, so as I said, um, um, we are going to start on the right-hand side of this diagram by focusing on the funding streams that are mostly, you know, it differ differs, controlled at the county level. So we're going to start in Medi-Cal. I realize there's a lot of information on the slide in front of you. Medi-Cal is very complex. We're going to be going through it gradually, so please bear with me. There's a lot of information embedded <laughs> when you talk about Medi-Cal services, Medi-Cal mental health services. So to start, start at the very top level, low-income children under 21 are enrolled in Medicaid. This is called Medi-Cal in California. Um, and these children are entitled to comprehensive and preventative health care services under a federal entitlement called Early Periodic Screening, Diagnosis, and Treatment, EPSDT. EPSDT is an entitlement um, that children enrolled in Medicaid are entitled to receive a full spectrum of health services, including mental health services. So 50% of California's children are eligible for Medi-Cal. Um, in California, most Medi-Cal covered services are provided through managed care plans. Um, these are nonprofit or for-profit organizations that, that sort of, quote unquote, manage the care of Medi-Cal and Rallies. Um, who these organizations and agencies are varies tremendously across the state. Um, all 58 counties have various health plans they, they work with um, that are contracted with the state to provide Medi-Cal services for that county. A couple examples, um, in Fresno and Madera County, those two health plans are Anthem, are called Anthem and Calviva. In Tulare County, um, those, those health plans are Anthem and HealthNet. Um, you can go online to the Department of Healthcare Services website. They have a directory of the health plans by county, so you can look up what, what your health plans are in your county if you don't already know. Um, so that's this overarching view of Medi-Cal very generally in California. When it comes to mental health, mental health um, for adults and for children are carved out into two separate systems. We have the county specialty mental health services on the left-hand side of your screen, and the mild to moderate mental health on the right-hand side. So I'm going to talk first about county specialty mental health, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about mild to moderate mental health. So um, county specialty mental health, this is sometimes, sometimes people refer to this as, EP, for, for children, sometimes refer to this as EPSDT funding or services. Um, that is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. Um, it's a little bit of a misnomer. EPSDT, fund, EPSDT isn't really funding. It is, a, um, it is an entitlement for healthcare services to Medicaid-enrolled kids. Um, the part of that EPSDT entitlement that is controlled by the county is for specially mental health services for young people. So I don't know. I, I, I like to clarify that all the time. I hear EPSDT funding all the time, so just a little quick FYI. Um, typically, these specialty mental health services are run by county mental health plans. This is um, 
typically the county department of mental or behavioral health sort of controls the specialty mental health services for young, for medicaid medical enrolled kids in their county very very generally um, you know it varies tremendously by county about how these services are provided for young people and how young people access these services but very generally, um, for an eligible child to receive services through the county mental health plan, the, a child, a student, must be referred to the county mental health department and then undergo an assessment for mental health needs. Um, the county is responsible for providing or arranging for the specialty mental health services that the young person is, the young person needs. How counties do this looks really different. A lot of counties contract out for those services, so they might contract directly with a school or might contract with community-based mental health providers. Um, oftentimes, a school might partner and bring those community-based mental health partners onto their school campus to provide those specialty mental health services. Um, other counties might, might provide these services directly, so they might um, hire a bunch of mental health providers that are employed by the county um, to provide these specialty mental health services. And again, just like a community-based provider, um, some of those county employees might you know, operate out of the county offices or might operate um, in community settings, settings, in clinics, or in schools. So it really can vary pretty significantly. Um, so this is so this carve out the specialty mental health services. This is part of um, a, a spectrum of services that young people are entitled to. Um, technically, young people are entitled to any mental health needs that they are assessed for and require. Um, Typically, specialty mental health services are intensive, long-term clinical interventions. So moving on to the right-hand side of this uh, Medi-Cal web, you have mild to moderate mental health services. So just a little bit of history first. Um, in 2014, Medi-Cal managed care health plans became newly responsible for the delivery of an expanded set of mental health services to beneficiaries with quote unquote mild to moderate mental, emotional, or behavioral health needs. For a variety of reasons, which I won't really get into, but you're welcome to call me and I'm happy to talk, talk you through this. Um, this change in 2014 didn't necessarily change access for children. Um, but it did bring a lot of attention and renewed focus in the Medi-Cal world and in med managed care plans um, to their role in providing mental health services. So while children were technically already receiving this mild to moderate mental health care before this change in 2014, um, a lot of health plans are now sort of working with their county, um, county mental health or behavioral health departments to build out the continuum of care for young people that are enrolled in Medi-Cal. So, you know, we hear a, there are a couple exceptions to this rule, but it's, you know, gen, very generally, most schools have very little experience contracting with their managed care Medi-Cal plans. They might have experience contracting with the county mental health plan, um, but you know, working with health nets or Kaisers or Calvivas um, or Alameda Alliances, that's still pretty new for a lot of schools. So this mild to moderate might, if you're in, a, in the education world, this might not be something you interact with a ton. I want to include this here because um, as the California School-Based Health Alliance, we work really closely with a lot of school-based health centers throughout the state many of which are run by federally qualified health centers. And so many of those school-based health centers, why I'm including this here in this, in this information, is many school-based health centers run by federally qualified health centers are probably already contract with managed Medi-Cal, me, excuse me, Medi-Cal managed care plans and may be billing for these shorter term interventions already. So, when we're thinking about the spectrum of how a young person might be able to get 
their mental health needs met in the school system, I, I want to include this mild to moderate because it really pertains to a lot of our school-based health centers and can pertain to schools a little bit down the road. So that's Medi-Cal. I'm going to move on to the Mental Health Services Act, also known as MHSA. Um, MHSA provides the state's second largest public funding stream for mental health services. This is after Medi-Cal. So we go Medi-Cal is a big bucket for mental health, then MHSA. This is a fund that is created from revenues from a 1% income tax on millionaires. Um, it's, the majority of it is distributed directly to counties. Um, the state holds some of it for some of their administrative and statewide projects, but the majority goes directly to counties. Um, MHSA funded programs are intended to enhance rather than replace existing programs. So um, counties have access, as the previous slide indicates, to a lot of Medi-Cal related funding. Um, so MHSL, MHSA is supposed to build out on, on those services that are not directly reimbursable through Medi-Cal. There are five funding categories. I want to spend a a little bit more time talking about two of those, um, the community support services and prevention and early intervention. Um, community support services is the largest category. Um, it's intended to provide funding for services identified in a children's or adult system of care treatment plans that are not funded through any other source, public or private. So this can, this is sometimes used to provide direct mental health care that might not be billable through Medi-Cal. Maybe the people, maybe the individuals aren't eligible for Medi-Cal. Maybe they are undocumented adults. Um, maybe it's services that aren't billable through Medi-Cal. It, it's sort of meant to build out the direct services that aren't um, aren't funded through other sources. Prevention and inter early intervention is a little bit different. Um, this is, category is intended to provide resources to prevent mental illness from becoming severe and to improve timely access for underserved populations. Um, PP, PEI programs emphasize strategies to reduce negative outcomes that may result from untreated mental illness, such as suicide, incarceration, school failure or dropout, ding, 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 uh, unemployment, prolonged suffering, homelessness, and removal of children from their homes. Um, I, you know, sort of want to highlight that school failure and dropout and suicide prevention, a lot of things that we hear from schools in terms of meeting the mental health needs of their students are called out in PEI. So this is a really, um, this is a really good funding source for schools to understand and get engaged in. Um, the strategy for accessing these dollars varies, again, varies tremendously because it's county run. It, can, it varies by county. Um, county mental health programs must submit three-year plans and annual updates to the state, which includes a listing of programs funded. Um, so while it can take a little bit of digging if you are working in a county, a really good place to start when you're thinking about how you can link your school or your school communities to the MHSA funded priorities of your county. A really good good place to start is to look up your county's most recent plan to see what they have funded, what their funding priorities are, what they think their need, the needs of the, the community is. Um, so you, you can sort of, that's a, that's a good place to start. So I did some very preliminary digging. This, this took me all of 15 minutes to sort of dig into these two counties. Um, I checked out Riverside um, to see where their MHSA information is. This is their home page. Um, along the top bar, you can see MHSA. And so I just, and, and then a couple ways down, the MHSA plan update is right there in that drop down menu. Um, I did a scan of their their plan update, um, an example, um, they fund two programs under early intervention. They have a category called early intervention for families in schools. Um, they fund two programs um, for outreach and multifamily group program in schools, and they fund a program for social emotional learning in one school district. So th that's an example of what Riverside is doing. 
Another example is this is Orange County. It's a little less easy to find than Riverside, but it, it takes some dig a little bit more digging, but is but is there. Um, they have a whole section in their um, PEI plan um, that is on school-related services. And these are all using prevention and early intervention dollars under the Mental Health Services Act. Um, they, they fund a program on school-based behavioral health intervention supports. And so these are additional supports along those three tiers of interventions in school, disti school districts that have identified the highest rates of behavioral issues. Um, they also fund a violence prevention education. These are just a couple that I am pulling out from these counties MHSA um, plan. So I think we have seen a, a growing, encouraging trend among counties using at least a portion of their Mental Health Services Act dollars to fund school-based interventions. So going back to the diagram, I've covered the three funding streams under the, the county side of this diagram. I'm going to now look um, to the funding on the left side of the diagram. And this is funding that's mostly controlled through school districts or the state education system. I'm going to start again at the top of the pyramid and work my way down. Um, so two funding streams, ERMS and LEA BOP. ERMS stands for educationally related mental health services. Um, this is a combination of state and federal funds restricted for mental health services to students in special education. This is funding, this funding typically goes to SELPAs, which stands for uh, ooh, special education local plan areas. Sorry, I had to think about that for a second. Um, it's a lot, lot, I apologize, it's a lot of jargon soup getting thrown at you. Um, so SELPAs, um, there are a number of them. Sometimes there's a, a SELPA for one school district. Sometimes a SELPA serves multiple school districts. So SELPAs receive this funding, and then they disperse those services or that funding to strictly to school districts. Um, eligible students for services funded under ERMS are um, for students with individual ed students with individualized education plans, also known as IEPs, who demonstrate behavioral health issues that impact their ability to learn and access the school curriculum. Um, I just want to make a quick note going back to this diagram. We put educationally related mental health services at the tip top of this pyramid. I want to make a quick note for folks that are on this webinar that are, you know, in special education or in the school district. I know that school students in special, we know, I know Lisa, Lisa and the California School-Based Health Alliance, we both recognize that students in special education are served along this whole pyramid. Um, so special education students aren't just relegated to this top tier of, for long-term intensive services. I'm just calling out that the Mental health needs identified um, in a student's IEP might qualify as these top tier three mental health services, these longer term intensive interventions. That might not necessarily be the case, um, but I just wanted to make that quick note that we know young, young people in special education are served along the whole pyramid. Um, we are just focusing specifically on these top tier intensive mental health needs. All right, back to school funding. The other um, funding source at kind of at the top of the pyramid is called the Local Education Agency Billing Option Program. This is a cost-based reimbursement program for schools. So schools, um, local education agencies, school districts, county offices of education can get reimbursed for the federal share, which in California is 50% of costs so that they get reimbursed for the federal share of health assessment and treatment services provided to Medi-Cal eligible students. So a lot of um, what gets billed in here is um, some of the, a lot of the categories in here are school nursing time, um, 
occupational therapy, physical therapy. So these are health services provided to um, Medi-Cal students. Uh, schools can get reimbursed for a portion of the cost that they uh, incur by providing these services to Medi-Cal students. Um, so eligible students are Medi-Cal. It's not, um, not for all students. It's just for the students that are, are Medi-Cal eligible. Um, this program, for, for a variety of different reasons, which I'm not going to dig into, this program used to be limited to services to students that are on Medi-Cal and are in special education or have IEPs. The state recently lifted those restrictions. So this, is, this billing option program can provide reimbursement for, services to, for health services to all Medi-Cal eligible students. Um, not just those in special education. The implementation of that change and the, all of the details that go into starting to bill for your non-special education students is very complex um, and is ongoing. So I'm, that's a, a webinar in and of itself, um, but I just, I, we, we wanted to put this funding source out here um, as definitely an option. Covered services under the um, LEA Billing Option Program do include psychology, counseling, and psychosocial assessment. So the two other funding categories that are, you know, quote unquote school funding, um, there's LCFF, which stands for Local Control Funding Formula, and ESSA, ESSA, which stands for the Every Student Succeeds Act. So I'm going to start um, in LCFF. So LCFF, many of you mark this. This is our, our top performing funding stream that you all are familiar with. This stands for Local Control Funding Formula. This is a per student funding for public schools. So each district receives a base grant per student plus additional supplemental and concentration grants for targeted students who are low income, foster youth, or English, English language learners. A quick note, LCFF basically pays for everything in public schools. So it, it pays for teacher salaries, it pays for administration costs, it pays for textbooks, it pays for um, teacher trainings, it, it pays, it's the full spectrum of public, our public education. Now school districts supplement these dollars with a lot of other sources, um, but I, this is not a funding stream that is specific to the mental health needs of young people, as many of these funding streams are that I have been talking about. Um, however, funds can be used to support school mental health infrastructure and services. Um, there are state priorities around using local control funding, including um, reducing chronic absence, improving attendance, um, reducing suspensions and expulsions, um, improving school climate. So we know that mental health services can positively impact all of those outcomes. Um, so because schools are now focused on some of these statewide priorities, LCFF funding can be used to provide a, con a continuum of support services in a school setting for young people. Um, and, and we believe that mental health is a really great um, piece of that puzzle for school districts. The other funding stream is actual is the only one on here. Well, that's not true. The, uh, sorry, I was going to say the the second one is a federal funding stream, but Medi Medicaid is a federal funding stream, so that's not true. But the second one is um, ESSA, stands for Every Student Succeeds Act. This is a rep uh, federal replacement for No Child Left Behind, which m more folks are familiar with. No Child Left Behind. Um, this is federal funding for public education. There are two sections in this law, Title I and Title IV, which do promote investments at the state level and at local levels beyond academically focused learning supports. So some of these investments include um, social emotional learning, positive behavioral interventions, trauma-informed practices, school climate, counseling, mental health, health services, integrated services, and improved school community partnerships. So I'm just calling out some of the buzzwords that are included in the Every Student Succeeds Act. 
which if you are coming from a school mental health lens should um, ring, ring a bell in your brain as, as, as incentivizing some investments in, um, in school mental health. Um, how this funding is distributed from the state to the local level is, is fairly complex. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but I do want to make a quick note that both of these funding streams, both LCFF and Every Student Succeeds Act, are fairly flexible. So when we look back at our pyramid for a full continuum of mental health services that we want to see in schools, we definitely encourage schools to think about using these two resources in particular, but other flexible funding out there to build out services um, that to build out services around those that you've created through more restricted billing and reimbursement programs or those that are provided by outside providers. So think first about what are your more restrictive funding streams and how you can maximize those funding streams to provide mental health supports in a school setting and then use more flexible funding stream like LCFF and Every Student Succeeds Act to invest um, in some of the, the supportive infrastructure or some of those interventions may be lower down the pyramid. For example, um, investing in staff time to build partnerships, develop school climate programs, and work with partners that can provide clinical one-on-one -on -one services. So that's a lot of technical information about funding streams. I'm going to move a little bit into strategies and next steps. Um, we've laid out a couple for, for where, you can, um, where you can take your knowledge and um, start thinking about some strategies um, to build out the mental health services in your school setting. So the first one, I think, is to know your population of free and reduced lunch, or you know, if you do know your number of, of Medi-Cal enrolled students, that's really helpful. Um, Medi-Cal numbers will tell you a lot about what funding streams make sex, sense to pursue and who your partner should be. If you have a high Medi-Cal population, I think your first step should to be to reach out to partners that also serve Medi-Cal enrolled um, young people. So reach directly out to your county. You are an access point. Um, schools are an access point to serve young people that are entitled to these services. So that can be a really compelling selling point if you have a high Medi-Cal population. If you have a low Medi-Cal population, I think it, it, it does make it a little bit challenging to um, to to find those directly reimbursable funding streams. And so that that is um, those are some strategies you need to make to, to work out. So Maybe the county isn't your first stop. Um, number two, assess your current services and gaps. Create a mental health profile that communicates the needs and access issues facing students. So do a needs assessment. Um, figure out um, you know, if you are fielding referrals for mental health needs or you have you know, done some case management for young people with mental health and continue to have a struggle continue to come up against barriers about for getting those young people to, to their entitled mental health services, that can be a compelling starting point to make your case. Um, you know, look at your absenteeism rates, uh, dig down and try to do a school climate survey, um, unearth some of the, the underlying needs of your student population. This can also inform who your uh, partners need to be. Number three is specifically for school districts is to commit to building your infrastructure as you reach out to potential partners. Um, I think it's really important for school districts to think about how they can build an infrastructure, a triage system, a referral system that will encourage partners to work with you. How can you, perhaps a school district wants to hire a case manager or student liaison that can help refer students to the appropriate providers. That can be um, a, a larger incentive for a community provider to come onto your campus and provide, health, to provide mental health services directly. If they have a contact at the school district that can help be their liaison. 
Number four is identify potential partner organizations. Who in your community is already serving your students? Um, are they, you know, do they have are they struggling to get students through the door, to get young people through the door to access their mental health services? Are they struggling with their caseloads? Often it can be as simple as providing that provider some space to, um, to serve some of those students. As I've mentioned a couple times, the school can be a really great access point um, to, to some of these community-based providers. And then the fifth one is to think through how outside services can be, will be coordinated with district services. So a school district might be responsible for some of the services in that full continuum of mental health services, that the full pyramid, whereas you know, an outside provider or a county might be responsible for, for other services that you've identified in that pyramid. So think through how you do warm handoffs between different providers, how you case manage together, um, how you build out the full continuum and bring partners to the table to create the, the full continuum of mental health services. So I've, I've received a couple questions, um, so which I'm going to pause now. Um, that's the bulk of um, the content I'm providing in the webinar. Um, I have a couple other slides with additional resources. Um, let me do that first. So first I want to just point you, this, the, the slide on your um, screen has, again, my name, Lisa Eisenberg, and my email address. You're welcome to reach out to me directly if you have other uh, questions that weren't covered in this webinar. We have a lot more information on our website, um, which there's a link on your screen. I will also, again, as a reminder, be sending out these webinar slides, um, so you will be able to hyperlink just from this slide directly to more information on, on our website. And then I also want to direct your attention, we released, it's not necessarily new, we released it at the end of last year, um, but it is a, a toolkit on public funding for school-based mental health programs. A lot of the content and more that I presented on this webinar is included in this report. There is um, a bit.ly link on your screen. Um, again, also, I will, I will include a copy of this report, a direct link to this report in um, the follow-up email we'll be sending to you all. But um, in this report, we have that pyramid um, with the funding streams overlaid, and then um, you can click through this toolkit, and it has much more detailed information about each of these funding streams much more information than I'm able to cover on an hour-long webinar, um, but that's definitely a, a very, a, a really great um, place to start to get more information about any of these funding streams that I've piqued your interest with. So now I'm going to pause and, and see if there are any questions. I've had a couple, but again, as a reminder, please feel, everyone is on mute, but please feel free to type in a question into the chat or Q&A box um, on my computer. It's to the right of my web, um, my, the screen with the slides. It varies depending on the make of your computer. Um, but the first question I got is, do you know if funding for community school coordinators can utilize Title IV funding? I believe so. Um, I would have to look. Um, again, the, um, the Title IV is is a very flexible funding stream. Sorry, I'm just trying to pull out um, my, my folder with Title IV information. There are three categories under Title IV specifically in Every Student Succeeds Act. I'm trying to find those really um, quickly. My apologies. Um, Title IV is the Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grant. So there's three categories under there. There's one for um, educational supports, like arts education and technology supports. And then there's a second category for um, the health and learning of students. So that um, is, a, is a great section under Title IV that can be utilized for a variety of health and student support services, which I would, in, and I would include in their community school coordinators. So I think the short answer is, I believe, yes, that Title IV funding can be used for community school coordinators. A couple other questions I got, we've received. 
Um, question, how can we apply for minor consent Medi-Cal? Can students already have Medi-Cal? Um, just in a follow-up to a similar question, is, or the same person asked a similar question, um, I would have to do some digging. I'm not super familiar about how you enroll in Minor Consent Medi-Cal. Um, minor Consent Medi-Cal is a separate program from that run by managed care plans. Um, I think it, I believe it is a fee-for-service program. Um, but I will do some digging. Follow up with me after this webinar, and I will see if um, I can get you more information, particularly about Minor Consent Medi-Cal. That is, a, that is a great question that does um, remind me that we don't include information in the tool bit, toolkit about minor consent Medi-Cal. This is a funding stream. Um, there are a, a small handful of services, sensitive services, that young people can consent to directly. Um, this includes services for sexual and reproductive health services, and in some cases can include mental health services. Um, so that is a gap in this information. Um, there, is, there are resources under Minor Consent Medi-Cal, and if you follow up with me after the webinar, I will, um, we can talk about it more. And then who can access school funding? Only schools, not school-based health centers. Um, yes, that's correct. So the, the funding that I talked about, um, the local control funding formula, um, Every Student Succeeds Act, um, educationally related mental health services, and the LEA Billing Option Program, those are all controlled generally by schools. Now, how the funding gets filtered, if it's federal funding, gets filtered to the state, gets filtered to school districts or local education agencies or um, special education local plan areas, it's that varies based on the funding type, the funding source. Um, but yes, all of those funding streams are, you know, quote unquote, controlled by schools. So if you are not, if you are somebody that is not from a school system, if you are a community-based mental health provider, if you are um, a county partner, how you access those funding sources sort of varies by the funding stream, but then it, so the strategies around that would be reaching out to your school district partners, um, whether that's, you know, if you are site-based, if you're a school-based health center on a, on a site, um, or you're a mental health provider on a, on a site that would be starting with the principal, talking about the services that you provide or the services you want to provide, and talking about some of the additional supports that the school district could be um, how you could build out or build upon the services that you want to provide um, and how a school district, how if you provide mental health services, you might be reducing the need for suspension or um, reducing chronic absence. That might be a good starting point for talking with schools. Um, I want to make a quick note, quick note about your second question re regarding school-based health centers. If you are a school-based health center that is not run by the school district, that's correct. Um, we have a number of school-based health centers in California that are run by school districts, so I just want to caveat, um, I don't want to confuse folks, if you are from a school district that runs school-based health centers, then you might be using your LCFF funding or your LEA billing option program reimbursement to sort of sustain some of the costs of running your school-based health center. But if you are a school-based health center that is run by a community provider, correct, um, a school, that school-based health center would not have direct access to the quote-unquote funding controlled by the school. But that is a good starting point for engaging with your principal, engaging with um, the administration, and talking about how the services that you are providing as a, as a partner to the school can be enhanced, built upon by some of the um, investments on the school side. I am not seeing any more questions, but I will pause here and see if anyone wants to furiously type in other questions. Um, 
I will stick around. That is the bulk of the information um, on this webinar. Thank you again for tuning in. Um, we always appreciate everyone's interest in school mental health. And um, as the policy nerd here, I love talking about funding. So I, I hope this was interesting and you um, had your questions answered. Again, I, the webinar is being recorded. We will send a recording of the webinar and the PowerPoint slides as well as um, links to some of the resources out to everyone that registered for this webinar. Thank you again and have a great rest of your week.